Sanford Dotson. You know what? You got a pretty cool job. Yeah, I do. It's different. <laughs> it's different. Now I've already snuck inside and I've already seen kind of what you're doing. But we're gonna we're gonna step the folks through through what goes on out here. Obviously, you're living out in the country. Right. Out here in Bath County. Out here in Bath County. And most people, you know, when, they th when they think about cheese, they're thinking cow or goat. But you said you talked about a proverb, or they were talking about sheep. Right. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, uh, "Goat's milk for drinking, uh, cow's milk for butter, and sheep's milk for cheese." And they still do that in Europe uh, quite a bit. But you know what? Here's the process. You round them up. I guess your dogs. You got working dogs. They round yeah, them up in the morning. We've got border collies and we've got guard dogs that actually live with the sheep to protect them from the coyotes and everything out here. The Pyrenees? Uh, one's a half Great Pyrenees and half Anatolian Shepherd, and the other one's a full Anatolian Shepherd. They're, they're a Turkish breed. Gotcha. So basically, you run them all up here, and these these uh, these sheep know that you got some goodies for them. Yeah, they, uh, they figure it out real quick. Uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, they know what's going on, and they know there's food waiting up there for them in the milking stanchion, so uh, they're eager to get up there and get milked. So they know that. They go in there, they get milked, and then from that process, the milk goes into an, another holding tank? Right, a bulk tank, a, a milk bulk tank, and it keeps it cold, about 39 degrees. It'll just about bust your teeth if you take a little <laughs> sip of it. Uh, and it keeps it stirred to keep the fat stirred in. And we hold it there up to three days until we get enough uh, milk together to make a good batch of cheese. Let's go and watch the process. All right, let's All right, go. Man. So now she's pumping the milk from that room over there into your holding tank here. Into our cheese vat cheese vat. Mm -hmm. We're in the vat, you're going to get it up to 90 degrees, and that begins what process? Uh, once we uh, get this milk transferred, we'll add bacteria cultures. Uh, these are just freeze-dried cultures. Uh, we're trying to emulate the same cultures you would have in the Pyrenees Mountains there in France that would be naturally in the milk. And uh, once these cultures are in the milk, they'll start to multiply, and they start eating the lactose and converting it to lactic acid. And we'll check at different points in time what the pH is of the milk and everything to check the acidity. Acidity determines which type of cheese you make. Also, the texture of the curds when we uh, get down to the curd level will also determine uh, the type of cheese. Right now, we're trying to judge what that point is the rennet actually starts to act on the milk and cause it to start to coagulate. That's called the flocculation point. And we can tell that by spinning a, a bowl gently on top of the milk. And when we reach the point where that bowl won't spin, then we know that the casins or the milk proteins have started to clump together. And that will tell us exactly what time we should bring our, our curd harps in and cut the curds. Wow, just like that. That's our flocculation point there. And I'm 30 talking. seconds ago, that was spinning a lot more than that. <laughs> now we're gonna let this sit here for about five minutes. They call it uh, a healing time to let the curd heal. It'll let the outside film build up and be a little bit stronger so it doesn't all just break apart on us when we start to stir. What we're gonna to try to do here is try to gather up those curds and make us a nice little mat down in there of curds and be able to strain the whey off of it. We're just starting to uh, drain some of the whey off. We won't drain it all off, but we'll start lowering the level of it to try to get ahead of uh, our time. It's a time-honored tradition, I guess, that uh, any of your molds you line with cheesecloth, and that actually puts a little space between the cheese and the mold, and it kind of wicks out the uh, moisture from the cheese as you're pressing it. And uh, it also helps to create a real smooth rind because you don't want any openings in your rind or the outside of the cheese because that's where blue molds can, can enter in and most people don't want blue molds inside their cheese if they're not trying to make a blue cheese. You're going to eyeball this and try to get six? I was going to let you eyeball it for me to tell me if I'm no, right. No, you don't want that. <laughs> or tell them what you end up with. 
All right, now you can tell we've got square pieces. We're trying to put them into a round mold. So I'm gonna do a little bit of shaping shaping here and trying to do the square peg round hole kind of thing. So that's eventually gonna be your wheel of cheese right there. Yeah, this is it. And everybody has their own technique for gathering up the curd. This is the way we do it. Wow. Now you have you have these big wheels, but I also see that you have little individual packets right. that you sell. Right. Uh, we package those for supermarkets, uh, specialty stores, uh, also for farmers markets, so that people can come up and buy a ten dollar wedge of cheese and you know not. But those little chunks come out of, 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 right. a, of a wheel. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now once you get it to this stage right here, how long does that? set like that. We'll, we'll still flip this another time or two, probably once, depending on what the bottom of it looks like when I raise it up and look at it. Uh, but we'll, we'll flip it again in maybe 15 minutes and check it. And then we'll press these for 90 minutes on this side. And then we'll flip them over and press them another 90 minutes. So you basically set these in here for an extended period of time, then turn those over and you end up with something looking like right. this. After about three or four hours of uh, pressing under the under the eight pounds of weight, we pull these out and we've got a nice wheel of cheese ready for the cheese cave. Wow. Off to the cheese cave. And we'll just place it and let it take its place next to all the other cheeses here in the cave. Now, you know, as I look around, you know, it's nice and cool in here and we see all these cheeses in various stages of readiness. And what is your oldest cheese you have in here? Uh, we have one from batch 14 that goes back to April. Wow. Now, what's the chances of us getting to taste some of this cheese today? I think we could do that. I think I'd like that. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. This is our oldest cheese in the cave. It was processed on April the 2nd, so you're going to taste one of the cave-aged cheeses that really going to have some flavor to it. And you'll see this one started developing a couple of little cracks in it and a little bit of mold got down in it right there close to the rind, but the cheese is fine. Uh, cheese survives well with mold as long as we don't let it gravitate down into the cheese. So right. usually as the cheese ages longer, the taste will become more complex. It, it will get just a little bit drier. A younger uh, cheese would be a little bit uh, softer, a little bit more moist. You know what, Sanford? I want to thank you so much for having us out today. Thank you. This I was a very it. interesting process, and it's nice to know. And you're you're one of the only guys making sheep cheese. We are the only sheep cheese in Kentucky. So there it is, and you need to try it. It's good stuff. This is what cheese was meant to be. Mm -hmm.